Hello everyone and welcome to another video on building serverless applications on AWS with Rust. And in this video, you're going to learn about a really important topic and that is the topic of observability. And I want to call out a couple of things I've seen on social media recently, some really good heuristics around observability. One is a LinkedIn conversation with Luke Van Donkersgood and Jan Chewy. And the other is some conversations that I've had with Martin Thwaites, who goes by martin.net on Twitter. And this is the idea of testing versus observability and why you're going to need both in almost every system that you're going to build. Testing is for known things that could go wrong. User input that might be invalid, load testing, things like that. The things that you can reasonably well predict that are going to happen to your system. Observability is important for the unknown unknowns, the things that you couldn't predict will go wrong. And I'm sure you've all been there where a system has broken in a way that you didn't even think was possible. That's the nature of building distributed systems and large scale systems. So you need observability to help you with these unknown unknowns. And that is where something like open telemetry comes in. Open telemetry, if you're not familiar, is a standardized format for transmitting telemetry data. It typically functions with some kind of collector, an open telemetry collector, and then some kind of endpoint. And now most open telemetry implementations also export data in the background in batches. So typically, whichever programming language you're using, you can choose to send trace data directly as soon as it's logged, which is going to give you a lot of network traffic. Or you can choose to batch up the data and the traces get flushed out to your backend every so often. So you need to be careful if you're doing this in the context of Lambda, and that's because of the way Lambda works. So imagine you have a request coming into your Lambda function, and you want to send trace data off to some open telemetry backend over here. Now, the way the majority of the open telemetry implementations work is that they send data to open telemetry in batches, which means when you set up your, your, your backend, your exporter, it's going to send the data to that backend in a background thread. It's going to do that asynchronously. It's going to send things, multiple traces at once once. What you need to be careful of with Lambda, however, is that the second your request returns from Lambda, so the response goes back to say API Gateway, this entire Lambda execution environment gets frozen or paused or just stops. So nothing is happening inside this environment as soon as that response returns. And what that means is that any background processes that are sending the trace data to your open telemetry backend are no longer executing. And that means your trace data might not go to your backend. Now, of course, if a second request comes into Lambda and this environment then gets warmed up again, well, then the background process will kick back in and you might get some trace data then going off to your open telemetry compatible backend. You need to be careful, though, because over a, after a period of time, these frozen environments will eventually be torn down. They will be deleted. They'll be taken back by the Lambda service. And even if you've got a relatively consistent load coming into your function, eventually... Lambda is going to recycle this execution environment. What that means is that any traces that are inside the actual environment at this point, any spans, any trace data, any events, anything like that, that haven't yet been sent here, the second this execution environment gets torn down, well, you lose all of this as well. So you need to be really careful if you're using Lambda and Open Telemetry and batch exporters to make sure this all, all this data goes. Now, the alternate option that you have is that many Open Telemetry implementations also support single exporters or simple exporters, which will send the data to your backend the second that it is saved, it is stored. But that's going to add an awful lot of network overhead to your system. So what you want to make sure you do is use a batch processor but flush the data after every single request is processed. And most open to them implementations, at least in the language that I've worked with, have this capability to force flush, to flush the tracing data out. And you can do that after each request is processed in Lambda. And we'll look at how to do that in just a second. But let's actually come back to our Rust application code now and look at how telemetry works. So if you watched my last video, and if you haven't watched the last video on project structure and things like that, I'd recommend going back and watching that first. Hopefully it'll be up above my head somewhere now. If you've watched that video and you're here, fantastic, perfect, you've come back. Let's start with this telemetry crate. So, of course, I've got my actual API, I've got the back end, the asynchronous stuff, but then I've also got this telemetry crate. And this is where I've got all of the configuration for actually configuring tracing and open telemetry and all that observability stuff, because this is a pretty common cross cutting concern that you will see in application development. Almost every single service is going to want to generate telemetry data. And you're going to want to do that in a pretty standardized way across your organization. So this is one thing where I think having shared code across multiple services is really, really valuable. 
And I'll first look at the dependencies that you've got here. And where, what makes all of this stuff kind of hang together is this tracing crate here. The tracing crate at its core provides a way to generate diagnostic and event data from your Rust-based applications. And then of course, there's this whole bunch of other stuff. There's a tracing open telemetry library down here, which allows you to integrate the core tracing library with open telemetry compatible data. And then you've actually got all of the open telemetry specific crates up at the top here. So you've got the actual SDK itself, an exporter for Jaeger, an exporter for just a standard open telemetry protocol. So these are the kind of core things that make all of this work. You've got your tracing crates down at the bottom, and then you've got your open telemetry specific implementations. So if we now go back to this telemetry.rs file, this is the actual configuration of our telemetry. And there's two parts to this primarily. The first is to actually initialize the tracer itself. You want to create a tracer provider. This is something that comes from the open telemetry SDK, and there's various different implementations of that tracer provider. And the, word, the way I'm working this, at least in this example, is I've got two different options for how my tracer provider is going to work. If the configuration data that the application is loaded with has an endpoint to send data to of Jaeger, just Jaeger, it's actually going to create an open telemetry Jaeger exporter that will di export directly to Jaeger. And what this allows me to do if I jump over to Safari now is to actually, when I'm running this locally, I can actually send trace data into Jaeger. You can see all that trace data here. I've just executed a couple of requests against this API and I actually get some data as you can see here. What I can also do then is when the OTL, um, OTLP endpoint is not set to Jaeger, I can actually create a HTTP exporter. And in this example, I'm sending data to Honeycomb. So the OTLP endpoint that I use will actually be the Honeycomb OTLP collector endpoint. I'm configuring a couple of properties specific to Honeycomb, so the dataset name and the actual API key. And I configure a custom HTTP client to use to send that trace data, to send that OTLP data, which then allows me to override the headers. Once I've created that exporter configuration, so this is the exporter, this is how data is actually going to be exported by the tracing pipeline. I then create my tracer provider. I add some configuration to my tracer provider, and then I add this batch exporter. And where I was talking about batch exporting or simple exporting, I could equally use the with simple exporter function here, and that would set up that simple exporter that's just gonna send data to the back end as soon as it's available. But I'm going to use a batch exporter, and I'll demonstrate how we can do this in just a few seconds. But you'll see I create my span exporter, and I pass in the exporter that was created just a little bit higher up here. So that's the first thing that needs to happen. I'm creating my tracer provider. I'm configuring how the tracing is going to work. And then I've got the actual configuration of my tracing subscriber. This is what actually configures the tracing crate. And the tracing crate has the concept of events, of spans, and of layers or subscribers. So when I create my subscriber here, I'm adding a couple of layers. So this tracing crate can also be used for logging as well as distributed tracing, kind of confusingly, but it does do logging as well. So I'm creating a formatting layer to format any messages that get written to the console in a Bunyan format that also supports JSON. So I'll get some structured log data in my console or in my actual log. So if I do something like tracing, call on call on info. This is actually me creating a log message, hello log message. This will then get written to standard out, but in a JSON structured format. Let's just delete that because we don't want that in there. The second thing I'm adding here is this tracing subscriber and also an open telemetry layer. And this is what will then say when I use the tracing crate, when I use this tracing crate that has no idea what open telemetry is, when I use that tracing crate in my Rust application, it knows to send that data to the open telemetry layer. And that's really important as you start to think about how this is all hooked together. So just to recap that configuration quickly, just to make sure we're all on the same page, I create the tracer provider. This is where I configure the open telemetry specific stuff, my exporter, where that data is going to go. And then I actually set up my tracing crate using this registry object passing in a few different layers and formatters and things to do. Okay, breathe. Let's have a look at how this actually works in the application context. So if I look at my actual API now, and if I look at the startup code of the API and scroll down in here somewhere, you'll see as part of this startup, 
I'm running that init tracer method. And then I'm also running that get subscriber method. And this is where I'm initializing that tracer provider. And then I'm creating that subscriber and initializing that subscriber that will make all of this tracing hook together. If you just look at this init subscriber method, this is another one from the telemetry kit. This function actually sets the global default subscriber to be the subscriber that was created earlier. So now anytime I use tracing anywhere across the application, it's going to use the default subscriber. That default subscriber has been set here and that is going to be this configuration up here, which has my custom open telemetry configuration. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, pop a message in the comments and I'll try and make that clearer. Once I've actually configured all of my tracing, that's kind of all I need to do from a startup perspective. And if you take a look at the backend implementation here, so remember this is all the asynchronous stuff that's happening behind the scenes, you see a similar set of configuration. I init my tracer, I get the subscriber, and then I set my global default subscriber to be that subscriber that's just been created. The additional thing you see in these asynchronous functions is this call to parse context from. You can think of a context in the lens of open telemetry as the specific trace. So I'm parsing this open telemetry context from the message that comes from SQS. And if you look at that parse contact context from function, you see I'm actually reading the message body that comes from the SQS message. And I'm using that to parse a trace ID and a span ID from the actual message body. So obviously this assumes that you're sending the trace ID and span ID as part of the messages that you're passing around. And I would always recommend that you do that. Pass the trace information as part of the message body. So the only difference being in these asynchronous functions is that I'm manually creating an open telemetry context, which will allow me to then continue the trace from my API through EventBridge pipes, through the SQS queue into my backend asynchronous function. I'll get one cohesive trace then, which is really, really valuable as you're trying to work out cause and effect. So that's all it is. Whenever you start up an application, whether that be Actix or whether that be a backend asynchronous Lambda function using the Lambda runtime, you can then create your tracer subscriber. So now for the important stuff, coming back to that idea of the Lambda execution environment being frozen, of needing to flush traces, because you'll need to do this slightly differently based on if you're using Actix or Axum or a web API, and if you're using backend asynchronous functions. And I'm going to start with the asynchronous functions just because they're a little bit simpler. So you'll notice when I'm doing a for loop over the messages that come in from my SQS queue, I'm creating the tracer, creating the context, and then right down at the bottom here, you see the tracer.force flush method. So the tracer provider struct has a force flush function. And as soon as this function is called, that will automatically flush the current batch of traces out to the back end. And this is what allows us then, so every time a message is processed, that data will automatically immediately be sent to the back end. Of course, of course, you could do this in a slightly different way and actually flush your traces outside of the for loop. Um, probably better, probably more performant, efficient, but for the moment, this moment in time, I'm doing that as part of each loop. That means I get that message data immediately into my tracing back end. So that's nice and simple. So however you're using Lambda and, and Rust and OpenTelemetry, just make sure you remember to configure your tracer provider and then flush the trace data every time a request is processed, however you're processing that request. With Actix or Axum, that's slightly different because you don't actually have the Lambda runtime as such. We're using the Lambda web adapter here, remember, to actually just proxy requests onto your backend. So actually, we don't have any way to hook into that end of a request being processed. So what you're going to want to use is some kind of middleware provider. So Actix supports creating custom middleware. There's a whole lot of documentation on the Actix website. I'll put some links in the description for configuring this. What's important though is I'm creating this custom trace data middleware. And the trace data middleware is what allows me to force flush these requests. So I've got the middleware here. And the first thing I do as part of this middleware is actually get the tracer provider. I pull the current tracer provider from the current service, from the Actix web application. I then run this self.service.call function, which then actually continues the middleware pipeline. So that's actually going to continue the request processing until it hits my actual application code. Any code after this self.service.call is what's going to run on the response when the data is coming back out of Actix. 
So here, when we hit this 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 bit of code here, the request has actually already been processed. All my span and trace data has been generated. And at this point, I'm running my provider.force flush method. So this middleware is going to force my trace data to be flushed to the back end after every single request is processed. And if you look at the startup code, you'll notice as part of this startup, somewhere in here, I am adding my custom trace data middleware there. So that's when I actually configure the middleware in Actix. So that allows me to push that trace data out to my OpenTelemetry backend after every single request is processed, which might seem inefficient, but trust me, it doesn't actually add an awful lot of overhead to your total request time. And that's all there is to configuring tracing. The follow-up question there, of course, is how do you actually get trace data out of your actual application? And the, the tracing crate makes this incredibly, incredibly easy. So let's come back to Jaeger for a second and look at this login method. So this, this is this first method called this first span here. This is actually created by Actix itself. So Actix and OpenTelemetry have an integration. And this is what gives me all of this HTTP host, HTTP method. All of this stuff is added by Actix itself. I am not adding any of this data. That's just built into Actix. Coming back to the application code into my startup, you see I've got this tracing logger here. That's something that comes from an Actix OpenTelemetry integration. Perfect. The stuff underneath, however, this login call here and this validate credentials, these are custom spans from my actual application. So if I go and look at the roots in this application and I look at my login method, all you'll see that I've got is this annotation on my actual function. So I've got a function called login and I add this tracing instrument annotation. And this will tell the tracing crate to automatically instrument this function. So the name of my function is login. The data I get in my tracing backend is also login. And you'll see this skip section here. This allows me to skip these variables being adding to my current span. So automatically this tracing crate can take the variables passed to your function and add them to the span. But I don't want to do that automatically. I feel there's a risk there of exposing PII data. So I want to make any additional attributes really, really intentional. You do see on line 32, however, where I am adding a custom username attribute to my to my span. And if I come and look in Jaeger, you see I've got the username there as well. And this is a super, super powerful way for instrumenting your applications because it doesn't then clutter up your code with a whole load of custom instrumentation logic. Of course, I've got the odd little bit to add custom attributes, but there's not an awful lot of tracing code in my actual application code. So it's really, really powerful. As you're writing application code, you just add these annotations to your functions and then you will just get trace data into your backend code path, line numbers, custom usernames. It's a super powerful way that adds very, very little overhead to your actual applications. And that is as simple as it is to start adding telemetry observability to your Rust applications. And the important takeaways there, make sure you're flushing your trace data after every single request. That ensures that you don't lose traces and that traces reach your backend quickly after they've actually been processed. There's nothing worse than having an error in your application and the logs and telemetry data haven't quite made it to your telemetry backend yet. That's not so useful for debugging, is it? And secondly, use these annotations to then annotate your functions to make this tracing super easy to implement for people in your teams. That's all for this video. I hope you've really enjoyed it. In the next video in this Rust series, you're gonna learn about configuration. How do you add custom configuration to your applications, both when you're running it locally, when you're deploying it into different environments in the cloud, how can you load in that configuration data dynamically? That's all for this video. Keep observing people. See you in the next one.